Guys, how are you feeling? Okay, so we have a bunch of new people in here because it is promotion, or last week was celebration slash promotion Sunday. So CY, can we give it up for all the new seventh graders that have joined us? Welcome, welcome, and welcome. Hey, really quick, before we even get this message started, um, can I have one adult volunteer come up here really quick? Just one. Andrew, come on, you raise your hand first. Come on, put some pep in the step. I've got a timer, dude. Chicken nuggets. Okay, here's all the VIPs. I need you to pick one for a gift card. Who we got? Sydney. Sydney! Where are you at, Sydney? Come up here. Here you go. Chick fil A on us. Enjoy it. Okay, that was literally it. That was kind of anticlimactic, but that, that was it. There you go. Cool. Um, hey, guys, um, I am so glad we're here, and I am so glad to be um, talking tonight and teaching because I actually think this message. This message changed my life, this message has changed a bunch of your lives, and I think this message we can never take for granted, we need to be constantly reminded um, so that we can respond to the gospel, so that we can share with urgency, um, and essentially this, the question that was asked over a bunch of different questions is what does the Bible say about salvation, and specifically the questions are, do Catholics go to heaven, what does the Bible say about other religions? What does the Bible say about idols? And is baptism the final step in the process to receive salvation? And so tonight as we jump into today's message and talking about what does the Bible say about, these are the questions we're going to be answering. But before we jump in, before we open up scripture, before we even start, um, if you're new here, what we do is we actually have somebody pray over the message and pray over the time before we open up scripture. And so... Who would like to start us off in prayer? Justin, take it away, bro. Amen, amen. Okay, so guys, my, me growing up, um, you would have said like I was a Christian, but just by the way I lived, like the, by the way I act, like I was the goody two shoes, like, my, like I minded my business, I followed the rules for the most part, and so when you would look at me, you would say like, oh, like Rance is a good kid. Like, like yes, I had my flaws, I definitely had um, like the things I struggled with, but generally like, I respected authority, like I, I was gonna be a, like a good kid in class, like I wasn't gonna be the person to stir up trouble. Actually, there was one time I almost got sent to the principal's office and I lied to get out of it, so don't follow my example, but that was the one and only time. Um, do y'all wanna hear the story really quick? Okay, completely unrelated, um, so I'm not gonna like get you with a little side um, illustration. This is what happened, it was seventh grade. I was in Athens m uh, Middle School and I was, um, we were taking like this, re I was, we were in writing class. I hate writing, by the way. I hate reading, and it's ironic because I read scripture for a living. Um, well, I read scripture because I'm a Christian, and I love the Lord, <laughs> and then I teach scripture for a living, so I've um, got to <laughs> change that up. But we were in writing class. I was bored to death, and I had my friend named Daniel, and he was probably not the best influence, and so... Um, we would get a pin, get a rubber band tied on each side, and then we would make these like little crossbows out of it. And then we would sharpen a pencil as tight as possible, pull it back, and shoot people in class, okay? Um, I probably gave too many ideas for school, but um, so we, it was quiet. Somebody's taking a test, and so it's me, and then Daniel is like, there's just the aisle, and then he's like two chairs diagonal to me. And so sure enough, I like, Hold back as hard as I could, just right into Daniel's side. And it didn't like stick and like penetrate anybody. He's like, oh. So then he gets me back, obviously. He's making his crossbow, turns around, shoots it at me, and it hurts so bad. So I was like, okay. So I had another rubber band. I did two rubber bands to like get some real like elasticity. 
I pulled it back, shot him, and he yelled super loud in the class. And the teacher was like, Rance and Daniel, get to my desk right now. And so she gets up there. And Daniel's a little bit of a quieter kid. And so, like, he, he was going to crumble under pressure. I couldn't let him talk. I've been watching Suits, and so I had a lawyer up. And I was like, I got I to gotta get in this. And um, she's like, what did y'all do? And I was like, ma'am, Daniel's pencil broke. And so I tossed him the pencil, and I saw a scab on his arm. And I was like, and the pencil just hit his scab just right. And he just over-exaggerated and yelled. And I'm so, so sorry. Um, and I just went for it. And she was like, I don't want to hear another peep out of you. If I do, you will be straight to the principal's office before um, I can even finish your names. And I was like, yes, ma'am. Okay. And so we went back. And then I went to, I was just, I was a good boy. Um, so that was the only time. However, for the most part, besides that story, I was a pretty good kid. Um, and the reason I start there is growing up, like, I was a good kid. By the looks, you would have said I was a Christian. And in fact, I even had a bunch of different perceptions of Christianity. So my family side, my, on my mom's side, we grew up Catholic. Um, I grew up doing Lent. I used to go to Mass. Um, I was dedicated as a baby in the Catholic Church. And so there was the big metal bowl. I'm a baby. They baptized me. And, um, and so, like I, like, I had, like, Catholic traditions and, and just things that we did. And, like, that was my mom's side. And then on my dad's side, he, his um, family was Southern Baptist or, uh, and fairly like a reformed, very traditional Baptist church. Like, you came suit and tie. And so my, like, perception of Christianity were all these different things. In fact, um, in my entire life, I was dedicated as a baby. And then um, I've always loved the attention. And so I got baptized at eight. Um, because I wanted to stand in front of the church in a white robe and get baptized and everybody cheer for me. And so, like, I, like, I'm just, like, and so I got baptized then, and then I also got baptized when I was 15 years old. Um, and it was at 15 that I really gave my life to the Lord. Um, and then I remember specifically, this was terrifying. There was a kid named Dentry or something like that, okay? Third grade. I remember him looking me in the eye because um, we were joking around, and then he said, Rance, I just learned something this past week. And I was like, you've got to tell me, what did you learn? And he says, if you lie a hundred times, you go to hell. And as a third grader, I was terrified, because I was like, there's, there's no telling how many times I've already lied. I've probably only got like 10 more lies than me, or I'm like, I'm going to hell for the rest of my life. And so like, like, as a young kid, as a middle schooler, like, all of these perceptions of Christianity were just, like, throwing me off, and I didn't get it. In fact, these would have been a lot of my questions. Hey, do Catholics go to heaven, or do Baptists go to heaven? What, what's the difference in a Protestant and more Orthodox reform? Like, like who, who's got it right? What does the Bible say about other religions? Like, if, if, if Muslims do everything that their religion says is correct, then do they go to their heaven? And if Buddha, if Buddhism, those who practice Buddhism, like if they, if they actually achieve inner peace, do they really go to nirvana and become a Buddha? Like, like I had these questions. What does the Bible say about idols? I didn't even know what an idol was. Like I knew American idol. Is it talking about American idol? Like, like these were genuinely like questions I had. And I start there because like out of my position of ignorance, um, what I was trying to do is be as good as God so that he would maybe accept me into heaven. And it's kind of these questions. Like, I didn't want to lie too much. So, like, if God doesn't lie, then I'm going to try to be as good as God so that he will let me into heaven. Yet, I didn't actually know or understand what it took, what it meant. Like, what is the process? Is it baptism? Is it a prayer? Is it how many times you go to church? Is it which church you go to? Is it which leader you sit under? what book you read, like what is it that actually constitutes salvation, being in a right standing. And so I would play Christianity from the perception of others, but without the heart affection and allegiance to Christ, it was empty. Like being dedicated as a baby, it was empty. I was just doing honestly what my parents did. Like I, I was just a baby. Um, at eight years old, got baptized, white robe, all of it, like by the book I was doing, it, yet my allegiance and my heart's affection wasn't with Christ. It was empty acts. 
And so what I want you to understand is no religion, no good deed, no amount of money, no connection to a church, no connection to somebody who actually practices Christianity. Like nothing will save you apart from Christ. Like let it be very, very clear. Let, let me set the record straight what we preach at this church, what we preach from this platform, and what you will hear every single Wednesday is Christ is the only way. And so this was, this was something like I wrestled with. And so um, as we open up scripture, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 19 because what we're gonna see in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16, is somebody we've known as the rich young ruler. And, and in fact, so Matthew tells us that, um, that this person was young, previous in the Bible. Um, Luke tells us, I believe that he was a ruler, and then Mark tells us that he was a rich man. And so this is where we get this, these parallel, like the rich, young ruler story. And essentially, this is what he's asking to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, how do I get in heaven? What is, what is it going to take? Like, what good deeds do I have to do? Who do I have? What church do I have to belong to? What prayers do I have to say? How many times do I have to get baptized? Hey, can I only lie 100 times? Like, what is it and what does it take to spend eternity with God? What is it going to take? And so Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16, if you're there, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like it. Okay, here we go. It says, then... Um, Just then, someone came up and asked him, this is the rich young ruler, says, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Verse 17, why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. In, In the King James Version, actually in the New King James Version, verse 16, it actually would say, um, and then someone came up and asked him, he says, good teacher, what good must I have, um, what I have to do to gain eternal life? And, it, and essentially, Jesus is saying like, hey, why do you call me good? Well, like, wh- like what is it that you're really asking? And, and, and if he's saying good teacher, like teacher, what do I have to do? And if, if there's none good but God, and if Jesus is good, then what the rich young ruler is recognizing is like, hey, Jesus, like, I believe there's something different about you. Like, I, like I, I'm, I, I see it, I just don't know what it is. Like, like I'm, I'm doing everything right, but something's not clicking. Teacher, what must I have to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus answers extremely direct. In fact, this is what he says. He says, why do you ask me what is good, he said to him. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. This is an interesting statement because I just told you the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus right here is saying, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Keep all the commandments in its fullest, not empty action, but grounded in faithfulness to fulfill all not one, two, three, four, five, ten, but 613. Everybody know, did you know that there was more than 10 commandments? Raise your hand. Yep, Sarah, nice, nice. Okay, did y'all know there was 613? It's a lot. Okay, I don't even know them all, but honestly, I should, I mean, I've read, no, I haven't read them all. I was about to lie to you right here. Um, I have heard somebody, like, list them, and I've seen a list, and I got significantly through it, but I don't know if I've read it all, so after this message, I'm going to go read all 613. Um, Completely, completely besides the point. But keep all the commandments in its fullest sense, not empty actions, but grounded in faithfulness to fulfill them all. And, and, and And what he's really articulating is like, hey, you can do them, but just the action alone would not actually accomplish the work like you have to have a relationship and we're going to see him reveal that what Jesus is doing is he's actually trapping him with a question that he will will ultimately show his error like what he's saying is Jesus is is trying to begin to help him wrap his mind around and he's going to get into a trap because what we're going to see later on in the passage is this man says hey I've actually done all those things what am I lacking what am I missing and so it continues in verse 18 it says which ones 
the rich young ruler is like now pleading with Jesus, like, that's, that's it? Which ones, do I have to, which ones do I have to fulfill? He asked him, and Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And what's interesting is Jesus asked him about the co- commandments, and he shared the commandments that primarily have to deal with effect, the effects of others. It primarily has to do with the relationship between man and man, the relationship between people. And he's saying, hey, if you're going to do it, you're going to fulfill, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your mother, um, your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, there's an individual, and in it didn't actually have this name on this quote, but it says this. He says, both tables of the law will test every person before God. It isn't enough to do good by our fellow man and be decent folk. We must do right by God and give him the glory and honor he deserves. So both tables, the law will test not just the way you treat and love others, but the way you honor God through it. And so it's not just not committing murder, but it's not committing murder and it's not hating somebody, which is equivalent to it. But it's to honor God. And so just doing the acts because it will make you, it will perceive you to be a good person isn't enough. There's something missing here. The approval in which he seeked was to be right in man's eyes, not in God's. And so it continues in verse 20. It says, I've kept all these. So the young man told him, what do I still lack? And what I want you to understand in verse 20, what you're seeing is the young man is asking a question after claiming that he fulfilled all the laws. And what this displays is that, that, it, that he didn't keep the laws perfectly and that there was something missing. And so just to kind of read it through and get the whole story again, it says, just as someone came and asked him, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus said to him, there is one who is good, and if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commands. Which ones, he asked Jesus, and Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourselves, primarily using the commandments that have the effect on others. And then verse 20, he says, I've kept all of these things, and the young man told him, but what do I still lack? He is displaying, like, he's saying in one part that, hey, I've fulfilled them, Yet, he's also communicating and displaying through this question, what do I still lack, that something's missing and that he actually hasn't fulfilled it. And the real question the man is asking, and this is um, a statement by Frederick Bruce, it says, the exemplary life plus the dissatisfaction meant much. In other words, what he said and what his question is, is saying a lot about what's going on in the situation. He says, I am on the right road according to your teaching. I'm doing everything you're saying. Like, I'm doing all the right church stuff. Exactly like I did as a kid, as a teenager. Like, I was doing the right things. I wasn't being mean to people. I wasn't stealing. I wasn't, like, compulsively lying or hurting people. Like, like I was on the right road, and I was doing the right things according to the general morale teaching that I understood. But then it says, why then do I not attain the rest of the true godly life? And so essentially the question this young man is asking is like, hey, I've done everything right. I'm following the teaching, but why do I still not feel fulfilled? Why is there something missing? Why do I feel that if I die, I'm actually not going to spend eternity with you? This is what he's asking Jesus. Hey, who really makes it into heaven? Is it Catholics? Is it the Baptist? Is it the Jews or is it the Gentiles? Like, like, like who makes it? Do I need to be baptized? Like, what, is that the first step? Is that the last step? Is that the middle step? Do I have to get in order? Like, how? How do I arrive? I've done all these things, so what am I lacking? I go to Cornerstone Youth every single Wednesday. I go to the prayer groups. I, I, I engage with community. I, I share 
with others when I'm struggling. Like, I, I do all the things, but what am I lacking? Why do I feel like I don't have a connection with God? Why do I feel like everybody else, when they worship, are actually experiencing the presence of God, and I am just a spectator? What is it that I'm lacking? And Jesus is about to get to it. Continues on in verse 21, it says, If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, Go and sell your belongings and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. What I want you to understand is what Jesus wasn't saying is sell everything and that would make you perfect. What he was saying is, hey, go sell everything and then follow me. Your pursuit of me is the only thing that will actually allow you to have treasure. Like, go sell all of that, come follow me. And in fact, in a lot of ways, and, and even the phrasing that he said, it's the exact ways that he asked his disciples to come follow me. Like, hey, lay down your nets and come follow me. Leave the tax collector booth and come follow me. To this young man, hey, sell everything, give it to the poor. Like, show your allegiance to me and come follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. Also, what you see is that um, what Jesus was revealing is that money was a God and his sin was idolatry. This man came to Jesus and he's like, hey, I've done all those things. I haven't murdered. I've honored my mother and father. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't bared false witness. I love my neighbor as myself. Like, I've done all those things. What am I lacking? And what Jesus does now with his next statement is he's revealing to this young man that money was his God and his sin was idolatry. And his way of repentance was to turn away and to give up his money, to sell it to the poor, and to follow Christ. It wasn't selling everything that would make him perfect, but it was his pursuit and relationship with Jesus that would. But in order to do that, he would have to forsake everything else and put God first. And what we see in verse 22 is when the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. He worshiped a different God. What is lacking, and what was lacking was his reverent fear for who God was and how God would actually be the fulfillment of everything he needed and not his money, not his possessions, not everything he owned. That's what it was. In fact, when I read it and all the commentary I looked at when the young man says, hey, I've kept all these things, um, most of the commentaries I wrote, um, read, understood and said it probably would have been very likely that the commandments that Jesus listed, the young man fulfilled. Because back then, and, and Jewish tradition, like, w when they were raised up, like, they would remember the Torah, they would live by the Ten Commandments, like, they would literally, like, like, they, they were dedicated. However, their actions were empty because it wasn't grounded in relationship. And what Jesus is revealing to this man is your allegiance is to something else, it's not to me. And if you want to, if you want to have eternal life, if you want to be in right standing with the Lord, you have to follow me. And that means giving up this. So I want to answer the questions, the first um, few questions. So what does the Bible say about salvation? Here's just point number one. Um, and this is the only point besides the answers to the question. What does the Bible say about salvation? It is found only in Jesus. It is found only in Jesus. Not the church you go to. It is found only in Jesus. Not how well you can perform. Not your ability to write worship songs or to sing and pray for hours. It is not in how good of a person you are. The only hope is that you have a relationship and you're a your heart's affection and your sight is on Christ and Christ alone. That is the only way to eternal life. And he's not, and this is not for the sake of just avoiding 
eternity from God, but it's to actually enter into relationship with Jesus on this side of eternity and on the other. It is so much bigger than fire insurance. It is relationship with your creator. It is the fulfillment of your life. It is everything you're missing and everything you didn't know you need. What does the Bible say about salvation? It is only found in Jesus. This isn't a fable. This isn't a story. This is a real person that died, resurrected, is alive and active and wants a relationship with you. Simply put. John 14, verse 6 through 7, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And what Jesus is saying is like, hey, there's no other religion. Like, like I I, I know you're hearing things, like different cultures are infiltrating the church. There's different ideas. Some people are calling me a fraud, but let me be clear. I am God, and I am not God. Jesus is saying I am God. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so let me answer your questions really quick. Do Catholics go to heaven? And the answer is, those who put their faith in Christ alone go to heaven. I I can't tell you generally that everybody that goes to the Catholic Church goes to heaven. I can't. I can't tell you that everybody that calls CY home will go to heaven. I can't say that every Baptist... Every person that goes to the Baptist church goes to heaven. But what I can tell you and what is evident and clear through scripture is those who put their faith in Christ alone will go to heaven. That we are saved by faith through grace. That God's grace covers us. It is a gift that we do not deserve, yet he still extends it to us. So do Catholics go to heaven if they put their faith in Jesus? Absolutely. Will you see denominations in heaven? Absolutely not. What you will see is believers surrounding a throne of a heavenly, holy, reverend father, and we are worshiping for eternity with the most joy that you've ever experienced. So do Catholics go to heaven? Those who put their faith in Christ do. What does the Bible say about other religions? There is no other way, faith, practice, or person besides Jesus that will put you in right standing with Yahweh. So what does the Bible say about other religions? Simply John 14, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, that everything else is false, that everything else is fragmented truth. It may sound good, it may look good, they may even recognize Jesus as a prophet, but let me tell you, if they don't recognize Jesus as the Son of God, the resurrected King, they will not spend eternity with Jesus. And that is why it's so urgent as the church that we take this message not for granted, but take it with urgency, sharing with every single person we come in contact with, because it is the only hope. This isn't a message of hate. This is a message of true love. This isn't a story of neglect or kicking people out because they aren't good. This is a story of God seeing people that are evil and corrupt and making a way from them, making a way for them anyway and loving them despite their disobedience. So is there any other religion or any other way? There's not. Jesus is the only way, and he is the only way we get in the right standing with Yahweh. God, Elohim. So question number three, what does the Bible say about idols? Those who cling to idols turn away from God's love. Much like this young, the rich young ruler and what you'll see, and this is actually Jonah 2 eight. Those who cling to idols turn away from God's love. What does it say about idols? That if you love your idol more than you love and have an affection for Jesus, you are turning away from God's love. This rich young ruler was given a choice and says, hey, go sell your possessions. Go sell the thing that you love most and follow me. Show me who you trust. And he went away grieving. He turned away from God's love. It wasn't that God's love wasn't there and ready to embrace him. He made the choice and turned away. So what does the Bible say about idols? It says those who cling to idols turn away from God's love. And it's that simple. So I would really ask and beg you to self-evaluate. What are the things in your life 
that take priority over God? What are the things that, if were taken, would absolutely destroy you because that's an idol? And so we're going to pivot to baptism because this is an interesting question. The, the last question that was asked, is baptism the final step in the process to receive salvation? And, and if you're not careful with the wording of this question, I think you could absolutely miss it and maybe even accidentally um, answer it incorrectly. And so um, I want to take a look, and we're going to jump to 1 Peter chapter 3. And this kind of is a pivot in a lot of ways, but also it definitely relates to the question of um, what does the Bible say about salvation? So Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 22. And so as you're flipping, I'm going to go ahead and begin to read, and then you can catch up with me. It says, Now who will want to harm you if you were eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And someone asks you about the hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. In other words, what is being said right here very clearly, like we are getting the command that says, hey, if somebody asks you for the hope of the world, be ready to explain it. Everything I just taught you, everything that we just read in scripture, everything that God has revealed to us, he says, be ready to explain it. Be ready in season and out of season. Share the hope of the world, which is Jesus Christ. Be ready to explain it, verse 16, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. In other words, do not shoot the gospel at people. This was my problem when I got saved. When I got saved at 15, honestly, I was probably one of the worst people to be around. Um, so I would go to school 45 minutes early and read and memorize scripture on cussing or lying just so I could go into class and when people would cuss, I would like give them a, a Bible verse really quick. That is not the gentle, loving, patient way to share the hope of Jesus Christ. When people would lie, I would be like, hey, there are seven things, that, or six things that the Lord hates, seven that detest him. A lying tongue. Repent, you sinner. Proverbs 6, 16. Like literally, this was me. Just imagine 15-year-old rants, a lot scrawnier, um, a very probably terrible haircut. Um, actually, when I was 18, 19, I could put my hair in a man bun. Fun fact. So it was shaved, man bun up here. Um, it was my... It was my glow up years, you know. Should I ever bring it back? Yeah. So do this in a gentle and respectful way. <laughs> Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed. And when they see what a good life you live, because you belong to Christ. And so it's not for the sake of of being right in man's eyes, but it's because you belong to Christ, that you are honoring the Lord through your actions, your words, the way you love people, the way you interact, engage, respond to your teacher, live above reproach on your test. Like the way you live, people will see that your life is good because you belong to Christ. It's not for your glory, but his glory alone. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing good wrong. Verse 18, Christ, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned but died for the sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death and but was raised to life in the spirit. So verse 19, so he went and preached to the spirits in prison and those who disobeyed God a long, long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his ark. Only eight people were saved from the drowning of the terrible flood, and that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by over removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven and is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and all the authorities and powers accept his authority. And so what does the Bible say about baptism? And you don't have to put the answer up there yet. I want to kind of dissect this text. But, it, but baptism is the picture. So water is the picture of baptism, which now saves you. In other words, you have been saved by Christ, and now water is the picture of you being clean and raised to life. It is not... It is not the final step to receive salvation. 
In fact, it is the first step to boldness. The, the first step of boldness. It is what we do after we've been saved. Baptism is a declaration to the church and to the world of an inward decision and trust in Christ. And Charles Spurgeon says this, and what's interesting is um, in 1 Peter, what we see is the picture of Noah. Like he brings it back and he says, those who disobeyed God a long ago, God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in the terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not removing the dirt of your body, but as a response of God um, from a clean conscience. And so, like, why Noah's Ark? Like, why the story? And the worship team, you're welcome to begin to come back up here. And so this is what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, Noah was not saved by the world's um, being gradually reformed and restored to its primitive innocence. But a sentence of condemnation was pronounced in death, burial, and resurrection ensued. Noah must go into the ark and become dead to the world. The flood must descend from heaven and rise upward from their secret, fount um, secret fountains beneath the earth. The ark must be submerged by many waters. Here was the burial and then after a time, Noah and his family must come out totally to a new world and resurrection life. And so even in this, what you're seeing is the story of Noah is the story of the gospel. Like baptism doesn't save you. It is not the final step. It is the first step of boldness. You have proclaimed, you have now accepted Christ, and now you proclaim it. And what you see all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation is a consistent story of God's love for you. And so let me recap as we begin to close. As do Catholics go to heaven, those who put their faith in Christ alone go to heaven. What does the Bible say about other religions? There is no other way, faith, practice, or person besides Jesus that will put you in right standings with Yahweh. What does the Bible say about idols? Those who cling to idols turn away from God's love. And is baptism the final step in the process to receive salvation? And it's not. Baptism isn't the final step in salvation. It's the first step of boldness. And so salvation does not save you. If you say, if I, if I came to you and said, hey, like, tell me about your testimony. Tell me when you became a Christian and you tell me, hey, Rance, I was baptized when I was eight years old. I'm going to press and I'm going to say, no, but tell me about your relationship with Christ. When did you accept him? When did you turn away from everything else and say Jesus is the only way? Because if, you're, if your perception of belief is based on the baptism and your baptism day, you've missed it. It's an empty action if it's not grounded with a relationship in Christ. There's only one way, there's only one truth, there's only one life, and it is through Jesus and Jesus alone. And so what I want to do, and we're about to pray um, and go into a response song, but I don't want to take this, I don't want to take this moment for granted, and I also don't want to assume that everybody knows this message. So if you wouldn't mind, would you just close your eyes really quick? And I want to pray for um, a few different groups. And the first group I want to pray for is maybe you're hearing this, and maybe it's not the first time you've heard it, maybe it is the first time you've heard it, but what you are realizing is you've actually never put your faith in Christ. You've put your faith in yourself. You, you've used church as a report card of your Christianity. Maybe your baptism date, like me, you were baptized as a baby, or maybe you are baptized at eight years old, and that is your, that's your grounding and foundation for salvation, and it's not. And you say, Rance, I want with certainty, absolute certainty, that I'll spend eternity with Christ and I want a relationship with him. Would you just raise your hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so I'm just gonna say this simple prayer and you can put your hands down and you can repeat after me to yourself. And there's nothing special about this prayer, but what we are gonna do is declare truth throughout this prayer of what Jesus promises us. And so, dear Lord, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for the perfect life that he lived. And 
God, right now, I pledge my life, I pledge my affection, I pledge my, my, my sight and my purpose on you and you alone. Lord, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I believe that he lived a perfect life and died the death I deserve so that I can be saved. And Lord, I believe in his resurrection. I put all my trust in it and in him and in you alone. Lord, I love you and I thank you for the gift of grace you've given me. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Can we give it up for the three people that just raised their hand? Come on. So, next, what I want to do is I actually want to pray for another group, but I don't want you to bow your heads. I want to pray for the church because you're about to start school. Some of you may have already started school. You're about to start school in what, one week, two weeks? When, when does school start, guys? Two weeks ish? Okay, we'll just say two weeks. In two weeks, you are about to start school. And what we saw in 1 Peter it says, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. And so I want to see a church in my, I want to see in my life, I want to see in your life, I want to see at Cornerstone a boldness to share the gospel. I want you guys to be excited and ready to see school, not as an obstacle to get to the next grade, but as an opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with everybody you know, because it is important. It is paramount that we do it. And so this is what I want you to do. If that's you and say, Rance, I want you to pray boldness over me. Rance, I want to live unashamed of the gospel. Would you stand up? If you can't be bold in here, you can't be bold out there. And please don't feel pressure to stand up. Like, if you want to sit down, stay comfortable, for real. Okay. And so let's just lift our hands, and we're going to pray boldly. I, there was a statement, I don't know, remember who said it, but it said, if, if your scares aren't praying you, they're not scaring the enemy. And so I want to start praying some scary prayers in this place. Because I want to see Rockwall transformed by the name of Jesus. I want to make Jesus famous in the hearts and lives of every single person that encounters us. Not for our glory, but his alone. And so, Lord, we thank you. God, we pray for just opportunity after opportunity. And God, we pray for a boldness inside of us to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to press in, to press into hard conversations, not needing the answers to everything, but Lord, just recognizing and understanding our hope is in you and you alone. That we don't have to defend the gospel because you have everything there. That Lord, that we don't have to be profound but God, we just have to be faithful. And so Lord, I pray that as every single student steps into their co-op, at their homeschool, Lord, as in the public schools, at games, at family reunions, Lord, that everybody knows who and what we stand for, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that chains begin to break in this place, Ge chains and generational curses begin to break over these students and their peers and their friends. Lord, I pray for families to be restored and that you get the glory and you get the glory alone. Lord, that rock wall no longer just falls into the Christian bu belt buckle of cultural Christianity, but Lord, this is a city that begins to rattle the DFW area because we are on fire for you and you alone. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And everyone in the house of love Jesus said, amen, let's worship. Let's stand and worship.